Okay, we're uh, carrying on the study of Lamentations. Last week we finished looking at uh, chapter 3, and you see how I'm doing this. We finished looking at chapter 3. I then read chapter 4 and am on my way through commenting on the verses in chapter 4. After I finish doing that, I'm going I'm to finish that today, and then I'll read chapter 5. That's the final chapter. You remember, the four chapters are acrostics. Or you had, chapter 3 is a different kind of acrostic, you know, alphabetical poems. Chapter 5 is not, but it still has 22 verses, which is interesting because of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, counting sin and sheen, that's one. But, uh, it, so it, it's not an acrostic, but uh, it still has 22 verses, which I think is a reflection of the fact that the others, others had been. So I'm going to read chapter 5, then I'll do what I've done here. I'll go back and start. We'll just see how far we get with that. Then, as I said, after what I want to do is I'm going to uh, to talk about the theology of the book. I've talked about that as we've gone along. But I want to just remind you of that and kind of uh, bring it to with some New Testament applications. And then I want to pick up with the history from the exile just to kind of fill in the gap there. Because we've done a lot of history from Exodus down to the exile, then I want to pick up with intertestamental history, what's going on there, because that's useful when you're studying. And then uh, I think we'll finish next week. Now, when we ended last week, we're in in chapter 4, I just finished commenting on verse 13, which singles out the, the sins of Judah's prophets and the iniquities of her priests. And I was suggesting to you that what's going on is that they were complicit in the shedding of innocent blood, and that they enabled or emboldened the perpetrators by failing to represent God accurately to them. That's how I take this. I don't believe the priests, they were out here literally killing people, but there was much shedding of innocent blood by the leaders, and I think what is being said here is that they were complicit because they denied, concealed, lied about the will of God. And how much God disapproved of how they were living and what they were doing. They kind of were, you know, quiet about that. They didn't want to bring that word because that carried political... Now, certainly there were true prophets. Uh, so I think that's what's being said there. Now let's pick back up with verse, with verse 14. Chapter 4, verse 14, and we'll just go through and I'll say some comments here. Now this is interesting, at least to me. You see, he talks about prophets and the priests... And then at 14, it says, they wandered. Now, you would think, okay, he's talking about the prophets and priests. He may be. I think with a couple of commentators, Hillers and Proven, I think that he's saying that the people, you see, the people, rather than the prophets and priests he's just been talking about, were left to wander blindly because of the failure of the prophets and priests. That because they were not teaching the Word of God, the truth of God, that that left the people without adequate guidance or the guidance that God intended them to have. And so they were wandering blindly because of that failure. And as a result, they became thoroughly defiled, which is a way of saying they became incompatible with God in that they either participated in the murderous acts or like the prophets and priests, they were implicated in their leader's evil conduct by their toleration or support of those evil acts. So I think he's talking about what happened to the people as a consequence of the prophets not presenting the word of God. That they wound up being incompatible with God. And then the picture that you get in verse 15, it seems to be the people of the nations. That's how the, you know, the, the, you, it seems like you have the people of the nations here objecting to unclean Jerusalem's continued presence among them. Now that's a shot. It's as though you have the people of the nations gathering and saying to Jerusalem, unclean, get away. This place is such a cesspool, we don't want it among them. And then you see that, that the city being removed through its people becoming fugitives and wanderers in exile. That's how it looks. He says, away unclean people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. They were taken into exile. People said among the nations, they shall stay with us no longer. Get rid of this people. When you have the pagans saying, get rid of this. 
And you have a number of places in Scripture, by the way, where it says you're doing stuff that not even the pagans would do. You see, not even they would do. So here it seems to me to be uh, that this is this picture where the nation's objecting to unclean Jerusalem. And then in verse 16, it makes clear that it was, it was Yahweh, the Lord, God himself who removed the city, scattered its inhabitants, and notes that he will ignore their plight. He will regard them no longer. So this you see here, here we have the exile, where we have this, this siege, we have the walls broken, we have the capture, we have the exile, we have all of this state of turmoil, distress, horror that is going on, and he's referring here to the exile. As, as evidence of the fact, he mentions that their captors, and that evidence of the fact that God will ignore their plight, he mentions that their captors, the verb there is pl- uh, third person plural, show no honor to the priests and no favor to the elders. This is how the people are living. In other words, even those of standing in the community weren't showed any kind of uh, favor, any kind of, uh, of uh, you know, special treatment. It was just, like I say, you know, the fire burned the place down. So here they are over here. There's no, nothing being shown to them. These people are, uh, those of standing in the community suffered. They weren't exempt. It wasn't like, you know, wealthy people weren't exempt. You know that. They didn't get to say, hey, I got money. You know, this suffering is for the saps. Well, neither did the, neither did the elders. Neither did, the, did the, those of standing, the priest. They didn't come and say, okay, I'm exempt because I have status in the community. Uh, no. <laughs> These guys said, listen, frankly, we don't care who you are. <laughs> you see? And you'll see later there, there are indications of them being tortured and this kind of thing. And as you, you can imagine, this is how this went down. Uh, verse 17 refers to the people having watched in vain for Egypt to rescue them from Nebuchadnezzar's assault. This was, again, you know, the idea of that political alliances would be our deliverance. That we will go ahead and we'll hook up with Egypt and we'll, we'll have this or some, some nation. And they will wind up being our salvation. And God has told them that that's not going to happen. I mentioned Jeremiah 37 verses 3 through 10 in which the Lord, he warned those in Jerusalem not to be deceived into thinking that Egypt would deliver them. But here they are, you can just see them looking. Anybody? Anybody coming? Is that nation going to help us forget God? We don't care about him. Is that nation the God who called us forever and ever to repent and to be faithful? I forget him. Our salvation lies in I think I see Egypt coming. Wrong. (laughs) Wrong. You don't see them coming. And they were destroyed, uh, holding on to that false hope instead of repenting and trusting in God. Verse 18, I think verse 18 is saying that in the latter stages of the siege that the leaders restricted the people from their movements from fear that some of them might uh, defect. Now, I'm not sure about that, but I think that's what he's saying is that when he sits here and he says, they dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets, our end drew near, our days were numbered for our end has come. I I can see that, you know, in in those stages when you see that and people start saying, "Uh uh-oh, it's over, we're going to lose, there's greater pressure for people to want to slip out. And I can see people saying, because that disheartens those that remain, saying, "Mm mm-mm. Uh, so I could see something that, you know, restricting that, but I'm not sure about that. That's just how that struck me and what, I, what makes sense to me of what's going on. Verse 19, it refers to the capture of the, the fleeing fighting men after the Babylonians breached the city wall. You know, this is reported in other places in the Old Testament. We read that. Where you had this breach, and when there was the breach, you had the, the fighting men fleeing. They were pursued. They were captured. They were killed. And that's what's being referred to in verse 19. In verse 20, it speaks of the capture of King Zedekiah. And you have to see how devastating that was. You have the capture here of King Zedekiah, the hope, the hope that people had that the Davidic king, you see, the Lord's anointed. This is a descendant of David who's on the throne, and the people had this hope, see, that he would preserve their nation. God, through the Davidic ruler, would protect the nation. That was what they were thinking. That was their hope. This is, this is the son of David who is ruling. God will protect us through him. And God had said, no, I'm going to judge you. And yet they're holding to this hope 
that God would preserve the nation, but that was dashed. See, that hope was dashed when he fled and was captured. You see, all this that they had tied up into that, that God is going to preserve us through Zedekiah. He is the Lord's anointed. He is a descendant of David. He is on the throne. God will preserve us through him. And then when you see him booking, and then you see him captured, you have to see it's like the curtain comes down. You see, this, this is it. Under his shadow we shall live among the nations. We shall continue to exist, continue to survive. Verse 21 is a, this sarcastic invitation to Edom to rejoice over Jerusalem's fall. You see, rejoice! And be glad, O oh daughter of Edom. That's what you be. You hated us from the get-go. Go ahead. Just have, you know, just rejoice at our expense. It's sarcastic, of course. You who dwell in the land of us, but to you also, also the cup shall pass. So it's a sarcastic invitation for them to rejoice at the fall with a reminder that God's judgment is in store for Edom. Uh, don't think that you're getting by, Edom. Yes, we're suffering. Yes, you're having a great time at our expense. Yes, you're seeing the horror that we're going through and you're loving it. But I got news for you. <laughs> Nobody lives the way you do and treats us the way you have and rejoices at your brother's demise and escapes the judgment of God himself. And so Edom, he says, is, is also going to be facing that. Verse 22, now this is taking this at the, the perfect here as a prophetic perfect, which is how it's taken in the NIV, the TNIV. That's, by the way, somebody asked me when I mentioned that, that's today's New International Version. You know, you have the New International Version, and then when they, when they came out with it, there are constantly revisions to it, you see, but it's still called the NIV. I have an old one from 78, and it has things in it different than you have in your pew Bible, but they're all NIVs. Well, the TNIV, today's New International Version, came out a couple years ago. I don't remember exactly when. But it's the latest iteration of the NIV, and it was substantially changed enough that they call it today's New International Version. But it's a community translation done by a committee translation done by leading scholars. So it's, it's one of the you know, notable translations. So you have NIV, the TNIV, and the, and the New English Translation. Uh, take this as a prophetic perfect. Now, verse 22 says, taking it that way, that Judah's exile certainly will come to an end as God has revealed. That's why I've changed. See, the punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, will end. It's going to end. He will keep you in exile no longer. It's going to come to an end as he's revealed. It won't be extended beyond that time. But whatever lay ahead for Judah, Edom's punishment was sure. So he's saying, listen, there, there is going to come a time. Your exile is going to end. The punishment of your iniquity will end. God has revealed that. It is not going to be in perpetuity. There's going to be an end to it. He will keep you in exile no longer. There will be a time when exile will end. But your iniquity, O daughter of Edom, he will punish, he will uncover your sins. So this is again a reference there to, to Edom and what's going to happen to Edom. Chapter 5, the last poem. I'll read it, go back and say some things about it. Chapter 5, verse 1. Remember, O Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We have become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. Our pursuers are at our necks. We are weary. We are given no rest. We have given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria to get bread enough. Our fathers sinned and are no more and we bear their iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is, I'll read black. Uh, English Standard Version says hot. I'm going to go with some other versions that say, Our skin is black as an oven with the burning heat of famine. Women are raped in Zion. Young women in the towns of Judah, princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. 
Young men are compelled to grind at the mill. The boys stagger under loads of wood. The old men have left the city gate. The young men, their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. For this our heart has become sick. For these things our eyes have grown dim. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. I'm going to change ESV here. Even though we have indeed, you have indeed rejected us, and, and I can't remember how the change is here, and you remain exceedingly angry with us, I'll have it in the translation. But there's that, that verse, how to understand that last verse is very controversial, and I'm going to give you the, uh, the translation from a guy named Wayne House who follows the Jewish scholar Robert Gordis in a way that makes the most sense to me. I think we'll get there uh, today, so we'll see. All right, verse 1, this is another, uh, another appeal. This is another appeal for God to notice their humiliation and suffering. You've seen this throughout, where, and this is just a typical plea of the sufferer. Or you're just experiencing so much and you just cry to God. You may have been there in your life. You just cry to God. And here it is, just says, oh Lord, look, take notice. Observe and see how we are suffering. And the implication being, of course, that you will cause it to cease. <laughs> you see, look, I'm just, we, we, I'm dying here. I'm dying here. Please take notice of how deeply I am suffering. In verse 2, it refers to the fact that the land and their homes are now occupied by aliens and foreign troops. You can imagine that, right? You have people come invade your land. They, ex they deport all kinds of people. Maybe the head of the house, the father, the grandfather, whoever they're taken out. You just have the poorest of the poor left there. They take over the house. They're living there. Uh, might keep you around to do chores or something like this. Your house, you're living as the outsider. This is part of occupation. This is part of uh, the judgment. Part of what has happened to them. So here their lands and their homes are occupied by these aliens and these foreign troops. Verse 3 says that the people have become like orphans and widows. See, which expresses their vulnerability and their defenselessness against those who are now controlling the land. See, that's what you get when you talk about orphans, fatherless, mothers like widows. They were vulnerable. You see, the powerful people, they, they had nothing. So that's what's being, they are defenseless. They are vulnerable to those who are controlling their, they're at the occupier's mercy. No power, no ability to assert any rights or anything. They are without anything, just subject to these people who have come in and conquered them. And don't sit here and say, oh hi, we're conquering you and we think that, you know, yes, we ought to make your life easy. That's our goal. That's what we want. No. You're simply meat to be used for my benefit. I may let you live. I may not. But this is how they're being treated. This is what's being reflected here in, this, in, in verse 3. Verse 4, he says that they have to pay for necessities now, like water and wood, things that were abundant. And free for the asking. Well, now the people who are in control say, no. You want anything? It's going to cost you. Water? <laughs> That's right. I'm getting from you every, everything. So you get nothing. Okay? You essentially treat it as dirt. And so this is, this is the existence of occupied people in the ancient world. And so here you just see the suffering. And, you know, after all of this... It's like you're, you're about spent with any more suffering. You know, it's like, come on, what, what can happen? How can life get any worse than this? And here you just have the pictures keep coming on, the pictures here of how they continue to suffer. In verse 5, it seems to express there are translation issues here. 
but it seems to express the sense that uh, living under the constant threat of harm from the occupying victors. That's what I get with this idea where he says here, our pursuers are at our necks. The idea of their breathing down their necks, see, they're constantly on the verge of doing something to them. You see that they're, they're always right there, just ready to do something to them, which keeps the, uh, the, the inhabitants uh, dancing to the, the Judeans, dancing to the occupier's tune, and which, what of course, leaves them with, weary and with no rest. Because these people, yes, you're here, yes, you are allowed to live, but you live by our you know, because we're letting you live. And so we basically own you. And if you do anything we don't want you to do, you're going to be in trouble. So here we are. Okay, what do you want us to do? And so they're weary. They're just being worked. They're being used. They're being abused. That's after having gone through an 18-month siege, the slaughter of the people in there, watching all the horrors that they've watched, all of these things. Now this is their life. And you can just see why people would just go, Lord, Lord, I'm dying. This is just brutal. Chapter 5, verse 6. This is notoriously difficult to interpret, okay? It's not really sure what's going on. He says, we've given the hand to Egypt and to Assyria. There are a number of ways that you can go on this. I think it's a comment on the severity of the situation in Jerusalem after the conquest. I think that's what's being said here. The inhabitants were so desperate that they were willing to bear the humiliation of making an almost certainly vain appeal for food to their enemies. Enemies portrayed here as the traditional enemies of Israel, Egypt, and Assyria. I think that's what he's talking about here, simply saying that we've given the hand to our enemies, pictured as Egypt and Assyria, to get enough bread. An almost certainly vain appeal, but we are at that point that we're turning to our enemies, our traditional enemies, and saying, can you help us? Because we have nothing. And their answer would be, you know, apparently you understand that I hate you, right? Okay, I'm rejoicing. But they were that low. They were at that point. Like I say, there are a number of ways to skin that. It's, it's hard to... to you know, be, be confident in that, but I think that's what's going on. Now, verse 7 refers to the fact that the, the sins of past generations of Judeans contributed to the judgment of Jerusalem. Now, who can doubt that, right? I mean, God had said, you know, all along, it's like the cup is being filled. He's been telling them and telling them and telling them generation after generation after generation. And so he's just, it's a recognition of the fact that past generations of Judean contributed to the filling of the cup so to that extent, the present generation was bearing the consequences of past generation sins. Now you have to be careful in how you understand these kinds of things. You see, this is different from being punished for those sins. They're bearing the consequences of past generation's sins. The example I like to use is husband and wife murderers who are convicted in their punishment, they're sentenced, they're banished to a remote island as punishment for that crime. You see, the children who were born to them on that island, they would live there as a consequence of their parents' crime, but not as punishment for it, but they're in the same situation. There is a difference between what you receive as punishment and what you receive as a consequence. And that's, I think it's important. Wayne House says in his commentary, he says, it's theologically essential to maintain a distinction between being punished for another's sins and experiencing the evil consequence of that person's sins. You see, actually, that becomes then part of the punishment of the other person, that you bear the consequence. You can understand that with your children. If I wanted to punish you and I harmed your children, ooh, you see, they would be bearing the consequence, but that's part of your punishment. Now, I have to hasten to add, the present generation was itself guilty, of course. You see, he's just recognizing that part of this is because of prior generations. He's just recognizing that, but of course this generation was guilty of sin. We saw it historically. We've seen it repeated numerous times throughout Lamentations. And in this final poem, the poet makes that clear in verse 16. We've sinned. 
So it's not an idea of like saying, no, we're not culpable. Uh, we're just the unfortunate uh, recipients of the consequences. We ourselves are clean. You see, that was one of the things that people started to do that God says, you're not to, you're not to quote that proverb that way, as though that exempts you from judgment. You know, our fathers ate and our teeth are set on edge. You know, this is not our doing. No, no, no. You see, you, then you're dodging your personal responsibility in the thing which God has given to you and called you to repent. Okay, so they're not doing that. They're simply acknowledging that, listen, the cup was being filled a long time. And of course, we are guilty. We are sinful. God is punishes us for our sin. And so they are being punished. You see? And they're receiving the consequences of prior generations. In verse 8, the statement in verse 8 that slaves rule over us, that may simply be a, just a proverbial way of saying, to say that slaves rule over us might be a proverbial way of saying that they're in a disastrous state of governance after the, after the Babylonian exile, under Babylonian rule, that they're in a disastrous state. This is, you see, in Proverbs, you know, it's a horrible thing to have when a slave becomes a king. Somebody who's ill-suited for that role to be given that power and authority. So here you, it's just an expression of, a diff, of a, the difficult, disastrous state of governance they're in. Now, if it means literal slaves, it could refer either to Babylonian or Judean slaves who'd been put in charge. So maybe it is literal. Or maybe it's simply a proverbial way of saying, hey, governing structures and all this is a mess. And see, government well executed, it's intended to be a blessing, right? That's why God gave it. But that doesn't mean it always is because it can be executed in a way that's a disaster. And so here we just have another thing, one of the kinds of things that we as people are used to counting on. Here we have just part of the chaos is that even the governing structures we're under are a disaster. So everything here is just difficult. Then the second clause expresses hopelessness. There's none to deliver us from their hand. Just This is our state. This is how we are. This is what we're, what we're experiencing. Verse 8. I'm sorry. Verse 9. He says, verse 9, it, he seems to be suggesting, now this is another one that he's not sure about, it seems to be suggesting that excursions into the countryside in, in search for food are fraught with danger. You know, I imagine that people are out, you know, hey, you know, things are broken down, this is a place, we got to eat. And so you have people who are wandering out looking for food somewhere, and that those excursions are fraught with danger, whether from attacks by marauders, I mean, you can see that, right, if somebody's out there, if I've got weaponry or anything and you happen to be out here looking, come on. I'm taking you, your family, and everything you got. I'll pull your teeth out. You see, so I'm sure there was this danger, or it could, it could be referring to just the natural state of danger in the wilderness. Animals, you know, when people are gone, you see this, in the, the, what, he's talking about jackals prowling over the place? Well, when, the, you know, when humans are gone, well, what happens? Well, we have the encroachment of these beasts. Uh, we have snakes. So maybe that's part of it. But in any event, it seems to be referring to some kind of peril they face when they're going out outside of the, the city limits uh, looking for food. And then in verse 10, it reports the effect of the famine on them. At least that's how I take it, okay? I think, it's, I think the more likely meaning here is that our skin is or has become black as an oven. That's how it's taken in the King James, the American Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version. I think that's the sense there because he's referred before about the discoloration of skin because of famine. I think that's what he's after. This discoloration, discoloration of skin in connection with starvation. You see, what a, what, I mean, what a picture. He mentioned that in chapter 4, verse 8. You see this picture, our skin is black as an oven. You know, when they've been burning and burning and burning, you see it in there is or has become black as an oven. And this is just another statement. I take it as uh, the consequences and result of the famine. Verse 11, it refers to the rape of Judean women. You say, how could that be? Come on. <laughs> Can you imagine the state of, of a woman in this place? Well, you have conquerors who are, you know, what do we care? You are simply somebody we've conquered. I will do to you whatever I want to do to you. And you'll shut up and like it. Now, in that environment, do, does it surprise you at all that the women are raped? Come on. <laughs> this happens today. You know, when you have, when you have people come in and they, they, they're fighting and all that, and they come over, take over, 
What do they do? Well, they rape the women. Why? Because they're ours. We defeated you, and we're doing what we want to. We'll take your money. We'll take your house. We'll take your women. What do we care? And, but you have to picture this from, you know, just think of how nightmarish that is. Think of how nightmarish that is. You know, this isn't make-believe. This isn't television. This is real life. Where you're out there as a woman, and one of these guys sees you and just says, Hey, uh, her. Just grab her. Okay, this is, what's, this is what's happening. And you just see, again, the context of judgment. What had God tried and tried and tried to get them to avoid? And then here they are in the midst of it, and you just see how brutal it is. So here you have this, the, the loss of family protection, the loss of social structures. You, that would leave the women vulnerable to abuse for a long time. You see, when the family will protect women. Brothers will protect sisters. Fathers will protect daughters. Government structures will protect. When those things break down, see, the dark side of men is unleashed. That's how it is. And so this is what's going on. So this would go on for a while. This isn't simply at the fall. This will go on for a while as you have people occupying, uh, occupying the city. Verse 12, it refers to other consequences of the conquest. Leaders were tortured and executed publicly, and elders were shown no respect by the arrogant victors. What do they care? Where, where you see somebody who, who was the society and the culture gave respect to. These people come in, what do I care about this guy? Oh, he was a good man. <clears throat> I'm treating him like dirt. And you see, hanging them up here, by their, hung up by their hands, they're tortured and or executed. In verse 13... It says that young men and, and boys became slave laborers, forced to serve the conquerors. That's what you have here. Young men are compelled to grind at the mill. Boys stagger. We're talking about little kids. Why? Because these people didn't care. You sit and go, how could you treat? Because they look at you. You're just a captive. You're somebody who has lost. You should be dead. You see, and this is how things work. You demonize enemies all the time. And so when I demonize the enemies and dehumanize them, well, I don't care it's a little kid. All I see is somebody with legs and a back, and I'm going to make him work. And so you can understand this, though, from the parents' or relatives' point of view. I have a grandson, eight and a half years old, and I watch him being abused and carrying stuff like this and can't say anything. Well, do you see how gut-wrenching that is? That's why we're being told. You see, you sit here and go, that's just terrible. That's why we're being told. That we need to come away from this going, oh, oh, man, how horrible. And that's what the poet is doing over and over again. Verse 14 indicates that normal community life had ceased See, the older men, they no, they no longer made decisions and conducted business at the city gate, which is, you know, had like a little plaza. You had the gates to the city, and then there was just like this little square area, plaza area, where all kinds of things would happen, business would be conducted. That's no longer happening. Of course it's not happening. But you can see how that would be so much a part of your understanding of communal life and city life, that to see that not happening, that would be a statement to you of how drastically things had changed, how things were just so upside down that normal life had come to an end. And so that's what's, that's what's painted here in verse 14. And the young men no longer enjoyed their music, which seems to be a thing of young people forever. But they no longer enjoyed their music, which was just a normal part of life. That was now gone. All of those joyful sounds they had, they were gone. And you see in verse 15, it says the people's once joyful hearts. You see, their celebrations that involved dancing, whether it be weddings, whatever it was. You know, the, these celebrations that they had, their joyful hearts, the celebrations that they once had that, in, that involved dancing, have now been turned into what? Mourning. No joy, sorrow, sadness, depression, bummer, cloud, 
That's all. It's just like grief. It's just this. What was it before? Hey, city life, bustling, life goes on. Marriages, children, fun, family, dinners, all of this. Normal life. What is it now? Why? Because you absolutely refused to listen to God. You just refused. I will not heed what you say. At that, God told them. And so they're experiencing this. I hear that first bell. Ha, I'm staying extra. All right, 16. It says expressly that Jerusalem has lost its glory, which is symbolized by its crown, because its people have sinned. See, so no indication at all, no attempt to sit here and say, no, that we're, this isn't because of us. The crown has fallen. This once great society, this once great city, all that we had, all the hustle and bustle, all the commerce, all the great buildings, the temple, all of that, it's nothing. Our crown, our glory has fallen. It has passed. Woe to us, for we have sinned. We have sinned. We have rebelled against God and refused to come home. We insisted that he punish us. We begged him to punish us, so to speak, by their recalcitrance, their hard-heartedness, their rejection of God's word, their refusal to listen to his repeated appeals. Verse 17 says that a consequence of all this is... In, uh, a consequence of all that's involved in this. Okay, I think that's what you, in, in, from verses 2 down to 16, all that's involved in this catastrophic downfall. Okay, a consequence of all that's involved in this is that their heart became sick and their vitality and joy in living had been sapped. That seems to me to be the, the sense of their eyes have grown dim. That their vitality and joy in living has been sapped. You see, as a consequence of all that had occurred in this catastrophic downfall, where are they now? Well, their heart has become sick. <laughs> he can't say it any other ways. What is it? I'm just... Uh... Okay? The vitality of life. Their eyes have grown dim. Verse 18 says, The sickness of heart and the loss of vitality and joy and living... In living is for Jerusalem, which now lies desolate. Jackals prowl over it. You picture that? You know, it would be like, you know, we would think maybe like D.C. after a nuclear attack. Where you'd sit here and you'd say, the picture would be this great city, you see, that was, a, that was emblematic of the nation. The center of the nation lies in ruins. We've got the monument broken, all of these monuments broken. And then you see wild animals crawling over the rubble. Well, what's the picture? The picture is that you've been smoked. So you've been smoked. And the people here know why. And the poet is telling us why. Why did this happen to us? Did God just get, you know, did he just decide one day, hey, I think I will no longer uh, protect and bless these people. I woke up this morning and I'm in a bad mood. Is that why? No. That's not why. It's clear why. And it's their sin, and there's a message in that for us. Verse 19 is a declaration of God's eternal reign. He's no less on the throne in Jerusalem's destruction than he was on the throne in Israel's days of glory. He was on the throne at the flood. He's on the throne in this destruction. He's on the throne when Israel is thriving. He is on the throne. He is the one who brought the judgment against Jerusalem. Because they rebelled against him. Because they broke faith with him. Because they refused to be broken before him. As he appealed to them. So it says here, but you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Now this said amidst the rubble of Jerusalem. Now that's, that's a statement. You see, that's a statement. That God is on his throne. Verse 20. This is the poet's appeal to God by way of a, of a question to decide that they'd been punished enough. See, it's a cry of the sufferer that there be no more. Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? It's just an appeal. Please. Please. 
Do you see what we're going through? It's like nobody else. It's absolutely horrible. Verse 21. Now the hope expressed here is that God in His mercy will restore them to Himself. That He will restore them to a prior state of fellowship and blessing. And then let me squeeze this in even if that bell rings. Now here's verse 22. And this is, I say, there's, there's questions about how to interpret this or how to translate it. And I'm going with Wayne House's translation from his commentary, which follows, as I said, this uh, Jewish scholar named Robert Gordis, and this makes sense to me. Here you see in 21 this appeal for God to restore them to a prior state of fellowship and blessing. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, even though you have indeed rejected us and have been exceedingly angry. Do it even though you have punished us. Restore us, despite the fact you have punished us. And if that's the correct way of taking it, which it may not be, but if that's the correct way of taking it, then the poet's acknowledging, see, that his plea for restoration is made in the face of the rejection and anger they've experienced because of their sin. And in that case, you see, it reflects the hope from chapter 3, verses 31 and 32. See, though God has punished... And punished severely. Though he has brought them grief, he will, according to his word, thereafter have compassion on them. You see, and that's what I see here. He says, restore us, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Even though you've rejected, you have indeed rejected us and been exceedingly angry with us. Even though you have been punishing us, smoking us, burning like a fire against us. Restore us. Because God had said he will bring them back. And he will. Now next week I want to talk a little bit about the theology of the book. And then talk about the history from the exile up to the coming of Christ. And then after that we'll have to see. Thanks for coming.